All right, everybody. Um, I see Glenn is online and we've got about 20 participants uh, in the room now. Uh, Glenn, shall we go ahead and get started or give it a few more minutes? Um, probably okay to start. We've, we've got it recorded, so uh, if people are late, they can catch up. Great. So for those of you who are here on the call, um, we're going to do about a 40, 45 minute uh, session on IIIF for research. And I'm going to drop into our chat a, um, a link to what we're going to cover today so that if you want to, you can follow along. Um, but basically, I'm going to break this down into a series of five or 10 minute examples, um, basically walking us through uh, how to find IIIF material, how to put it into a viewer of your choice, uh, how to add simple annotations or use annotations to walk a viewer through an object, uh, how to talk about transcriptions, and then how all of that plays together in the basic research environment. And these examples are mostly pointing towards things that we will see in more detail over the course of the week, um, but also growing out of use cases that were articulated during the project breakout sessions this morning. Uh, as we go through, please feel free to drop questions into chat. I'm hoping that Glenn will be willing to help out and shout if he sees questions pop up that I haven't seen, or Mike Appleby will do the same. Uh, and we can try to answer them together uh, towards the end. Uh, I'm going to pause after each section, though, in case there are any questions about what I'm covering as we go through them, uh, so that we can hopefully head off any confusion right at the beginning. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, and I'm going to just go ahead and drop that link into chat one more time because Zoom doesn't like to, uh, to retain chat for new uh, joiners. And I think we are now at 21, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen uh, so that you can see what I'm looking at, and we will go from there. Okay, so first question. Can everybody see my screen? Okay, I'm getting a thumbs up from a few. Perfect. Um, so just to get started, the very basics uh, that we're going to cover today are looking at things that are driven by uh, two of the IIIF APIs. And as Glenn mentioned earlier this morning, we'll look at some of the other APIs in a little bit more detail as we go through this week. Uh, but the two that we're going to spend the most time with in this particular session are the image API and the presentation API. Now, Mike's going to give us a lot more detail about uh, these APIs as we go through the week. Uh, but let's just quickly refresh our memories about what these are and why we care about them today. Uh, so the image API uh, is primarily about uh, moving pixels and manipulating pixels uh, in a URL format. And I've linked out to uh, Jack Reed's image API playground that he developed uh, just to give us an idea of what it looks like when we play with these things. Uh, so the API is basically something that looks like a URL that has server prefix, image identifier, and then some things that we're going to be manipulating. Uh, and a lot of the times, the software that we're working with will manipulate these behind the scenes, and we won't have to care about them. But for today, let's just take a quick look at this so that we know what's, what's happening behind the scenes with the software that we're looking at. Uh, first thing you notice here in Jack's uh, demo is that there's a region of interest called out. And that region happens to focus on Martin Luther King Jr.'s face. Uh, why don't we change that uh, using the full parameter? And we can see that that image is much larger and includes a number of different people in the image. So basically, we've moved from a small crop of the image being performed by the API to the full image as we look at it. Uh, the next thing to think about is size. And this percentage size parameter allows us to manipulate image size, overall image size by uh, percentage. As you can see, when we went to full, that made the image so large that it no longer fits in Jack's nice little uh, screen. So I'm going to make the image a little bit smaller, 10%. 
and we can see that it now fits within that container element uh, pretty nicely. Uh, now, if we wanted to rotate this image for whatever reason, for instance, to see text or details at a different rotation angle, we can do that with the rotation parameter, which simply takes those pixels and shifts them to the side. And then we can look at other uh, things like quality and format later. We're not gonna look at those today, but these three that I just demonstrated, uh, choosing a region of interest within an, in, an, in an image, resizing it and rotating it. These are things that we do all of the time when we're working with IIIF images. So I felt like it was worth calling out a little bit more uh, just right here at the beginning. Just as an example of what it is that we're doing when we manipulate images with IIIF. Now the link for that playground is in our, um, is in our git book. Uh, so you can go back in and play with that uh, and play around with the different parameters yourself. The other thing that I wanted to call out up front is that the presentation API organizes uh, images and other materials together to basically sh give us a user experience. And the only reason I'm calling this out now is that there's a little bit of vocabulary in IIIF that doesn't always make sense uh, right up front. So I wanted to call out a vocabulary term that we'll come back to again and again over the course of the week, which is manifest. Now that manifest is a bundle of information. We're gonna pick that apart in some detail so that we can see what all of the different pieces of information do within that bundle. But for now, uh, let's just remember that it is a bundle of information that basically encapsulates a digital object. It is part of what makes uh, viewing things in Mirador or the universal viewer possible. And uh, it gives information depending on what kind of uh, object we're looking at or what an institution has chosen to include. So it might include things like licensing information. It might include additional descriptions of the object that we're looking at. It might include a sequence of images so that you could walk through a book, for instance. Um, it might also provide a table of contents. Um, but all of these are sort of semi-optional uh, and certainly we'll get into the implementation details of these in a little bit more detail as we move forward. So that's just a little bit of review from what we talked about uh, or what Glenn presented in his uh, initial introduction this morning. Uh, and as we go through, we can address questions that might arise about those as well. Uh, the first thing we're gonna do though, as IIIF uh, researchers, is talk about finding IIIF materials in the wild. And um, what I've given you here uh, in this section is just a few examples of institutions that have made IIIF materials available. And what I'd like to do is take a look at those for a few minutes, just so that you can get a sense of how different each institution um, is presenting the fact that their materials are available by IIIF. Uh, it's a little bit confusing as people get started because it's not always clear uh, where to find a IIIF object. Uh, and we as a community are working towards making that a little bit easier for users. Um, but let's take a look at what different implementations might look like. And the first one I'm gonna look at is the Bayerisch Staatsbibliothek um, because they like to put their IIIF availability front and center. And so what they have here is uh, digital collections of the Bavarian State Library, all delivered via IIIF. So you know when you get to the site, you're working with IIIF materials. Beyond that, they also include this IIIF logo right in the, the search results, basically. Uh, and what that IIIF symbol represents is the IIIF manifest, as you can see if you mouse over it. It says IIIF manifest there. If we click on it, we'll pull up a bunch of JSON. Uh, if we drag it, we will move the digital object into another viewer, basically. Uh, but the BSB has made this very clear and simple to look at. Uh, so we know that we're working with IIIF materials. Let's take a look at Stanford uh, Special Collections, where I work. And if we open this up, same sort of thing is appearing here, where the IIIF logo is appearing in search results, allowing a user to know that they've got 
a, a IIIF object and that it can be used in uh, other software. Now, a little bit more complicated is the Vatican. We're going to go ahead and open that up. And when we get to the Vatican, we don't see much about IIIF at all here. Down here, it does say that the DigiVatLib uses IIIF technologies. And if you read a little bit more, you can find out more details. Let's, uh, we don't see that IIIF logo attached to the objects quite yet. Let's go ahead and look at one of these objects. Clicking on that link is going to open up uh, an item in a viewer. And we still don't see uh, that this is a IIIF object. Um, in fact, to get to the IIIF part, you actually have to open up the additional information. So instead of foregrounding that IIIF logo like the BSB did, the Vatican has it attached as metadata within the object. And this is fairly common uh, as well, uh, another pattern that we see throughout the, the community. Uh, I'm also going to open up one more viewer uh, many of you have probably worked with the, the digital library at the Bibliothèque Nationale, and you can see that uh, there are a number of items here. Um, let's just look up one for fun. Uh, bring up an object. We still don't see any IIIF material. Uh, no logos uh, telling us that something might be IIIF. We're going to open up an individual object. And again, we see nothing here that suggests that this might be IIIF compliant uh, anywhere. And um, that's a problem for us as users because many, many people in the IIIF community want to use the Bibliothèque Nationale material. Uh, we all know there's good material there and we know that they're IIIF partners. Uh, so what does that mean for us? Well, there's a hidden way of getting to the IIIF link here um, by manipulating the URL. And here we get to an underlying manifest, uh, but it's not centered front and center in the uh, interface for Gallica. Um, so what we've seen here in just a few minutes is a whole range of implementation approaches for letting people know that material is available in IIIF. Um, some more confusing and frustrating for users than others. Um, but just wanted to give you a sense right at the beginning of the week of how varied implementation processes are across institutions. And it's something to think about as you think about your projects for this week is how do you want to let people know that you're working with IIIF material or that you're serving IIIF material uh, and which, which particular pattern might work best for your project is something to consider. Okay, so I'm gonna pause there for just a second. Are there any questions? And you can put them into chat or you can, I think unmute yourself and, and ask. Glenn, I don't see any questions popping up. And so just, oh, there's one. Is a manifest always for a whole book? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, no. Uh, in practice, uh, a manifest should encapsulate your digital object. And how you define that object can vary. Uh, one of the next examples we're going to look at um, takes a manifest for every image instead of for a group of images. Uh, so we'll look at that in a little bit more detail in a minute. Best practice, I think, uh, is probably something that we could talk about over the course of the week. But essentially, the manifest should encapsulate the thing that you think of as a digital object uh, or that an institution wants to present as a digital object so that a user doesn't have to collect multiple manifests to build a book. Um, but that does vary by institution. Excellent question though. Uh, so really the manifest is just a digital object. How we define that is a little bit open for interpretation. Uh, thanks for that question though. And we can come back to that. 
Okay, so the next thing that we're going to do to go, oh, there's another one. Uh, does an image need to be a certain size quality to be used within IIIF, even if the institution doesn't declare themselves as being a IIIF partner? The short answer is no. Um, the practical answer is that if you want to deliver an image via IIIF, uh, it can be any size, uh, really, and any quality. Um, your user experience, though, will vary greatly depending on the, the quality of the source images that you start with. Um, and if that doesn't completely answer your question, we can come back to that in a minute. Okay, so the next thing that I would like to talk about uh, after we've found our objects in the wild is what it means to work with a IIIF object that you've found. Uh, and one of the things that I think is particularly helpful when we think about this is contrasting sort of the old web with what IIIF enables. And uh, one way of doing that is to take a look at something like this Vatican object. So in the old days, uh, you would go to an institution's website and you would look at the digital object in their environment. Uh, and you are limited to the tools that they offer within that particular environment. Uh, so the Vatican has a particularly nice site. They've got a viewer that zooms in and out, offers a couple of different viewing uh, modes, like thumbnails or two page up or one page up. Um, they show you thumbnails to navigate with through an object. And the zooming, of course, is quite nice. Uh, they also offer tables of contents for some of their material, like this, which also allows you to navigate through the object. But they don't offer side-by-side -side comparison, for instance, and they don't offer image manipulation tools. Uh, they don't offer annotation. This is just a simple image viewer. What IIIF does is it makes each of these digital objects portable. So instead of going to an institutional portal, you take advantage of a portable digital object. Uh, and one of the ways that you can do that is through this uh, IIIF manifest that we talked about earlier. So what I'm gonna do is take a look at closing a few of these windows to start off with. I'm gonna look at a very simple Mirador to set up and see what we can do with taking advantage of these portable digital objects. So one of the things that you see in a lot of institutions is this IIIF logo representing the manifest. And one of the first actions that you can do with that is simply drag it over to the tab where Mirador is and drop it in. And we have now pulled that Vatican manuscript out of the Vatican portal, used its portability made available by IIIF and dropped it into a, another viewer altogether. And this happens to be an older version of Mirador that I, I host myself. Uh, so you can pull an object from another institution into your hosted example of a viewer. Could be Mirador, it could be others. And then you can do other things with it. So for instance, we have that table of contents that has come along with the digital object because that was in their manifest. We have a sequence of images that um, were available in that other manifest. We have a lot of metadata, or a little bit of metadata in this case, uh, including a date and a title and attribution, um, as well as a link to their metadata. And we've pulled that all into a new environment. And now we can do some additional manipulation, including gallery view or a scrolling view so that we can move quickly through the object or setting up a, a book view again, as we might want to. But what we can do now is also compare that object to something else. And what we're gonna compare it to is something held at Stanford. So now I'm going to the Stanford portal. I'm gonna grab that IIIF logo from Stanford. I'm gonna drag it over to my Mirador viewer and I'm gonna open that up. So now we have in an environment that we control as users, uh, content being served by the Vatican and content being served by Stanford side by side. Uh, so that's a very simple um, activity, 
there's a lot going on under the scenes, but it's, it's one of the, the core uh, use cases for uh, manuscript and book-based research is to bring up two examples side by side, compare them, and be able to talk about things like differences in script, differences in decoration, um, differences in text and things like that. So it opens up a conversation between two objects. Uh, and the very nice benefit is that I, as an individual researcher, don't have to go get those images and host them myself. Now, many of your projects will focus on hosting your own images, uh, but the very simplest use case, of course, is coming to content that's already out there in IIIF land and bringing it together for research and work. Uh, so I kind of went through a, a number of steps there fairly quickly. I'm going to pause again to see if there are any questions about that basic activity of finding content, taking advantage of the IIIF portability, and pulling it into another environment altogether. So any questions on that? While you're thinking about that, I'm going to go ahead and copy this manifest URI from the Vatican. And we're going to go over to the Universal Viewer as well, drop that manifest in, and open that object up in a separate viewer altogether. So again, this is uh, a different AAAF viewer, but I wanted to show you that the experience is very similar. So not only are we pulling content from different locations, we can put it into all kinds of different software, depending on what it is that we want to do with, uh, with the item. And here you see that same thumbnail list in a slightly different location. You see some of the metadata, like that table of contents, but again, in a different viewing location and some of that uh, additional descriptive metadata uh, set up on the side as well. So a, a different user experience, same digital object, uh, but also um, you're working with something that can be dropped into all kinds of different contexts for a particular research purpose or user's purpose. Okay, so is that clear to everybody? can't see your faces, so it becomes very difficult to, to see. I see Katerina is nodding. Mariana, thank you. Okay, great. So we've done the, the basic activity of moving an object into another environment. Close up a couple of these windows again. And what we're going to do now is do stuff with it. So we've looked at zooming, we've looked at comparison, I encourage you to experiment with this on your own. Uh, there are plenty of links in the Git book so that you can go to the, these software tools and play with them yourself. But the next step is to look at annotations. And as we were talking in our groups this morning, annotating uh, digital objects seems to be at the heart of a lot of the projects that we're particularly interested in. And annotations in the IIIF world are um, are special. <laughs> and Glenn uh, will explain this in a lot more detail because he is an expert in IIIF annotation. Um, but the easiest way to think about it for me uh, as a user is that an annotation is simply a way of associating uh, some kind of digital content with other kinds of digital content. And it might be associating an image with another image. It might be associating a comment with an image. It might be associating a transcription with an image. Um, and so we're going to use the term, the vocabulary term annotation uh, in a very generic sense here. Uh, so one of the things that a, an annotation could be would be a marginal comment, a uh, comment in the margin of a book. Uh, but that's not all it is in the IIIF context. So first thing I'm going to do is walk you through a, a nice project that was done at the Vatican uh, over the last couple of years, uh, where they took about 300 of their manuscripts and created annotations of various types. 
uh, and then are using them to help guide viewers through their collection. Uh, and so if we take a look at one of their exhibits, the Library of the Humanist Prints, you'll see that there's a facet here called annotation tags. And I encourage you to explore this on your own. And if we open up the annotation tags, we see that there are a variety of guide, guide terms that have been added here. And one of those is angels bearing a coat of arms. So presumably when we click on that, we're going to see um, different images of angels holding a coat of arms. So let's go ahead and click on that. And in fact, that is what we see. So we have four examples of annotations here that are angels holding coats of arms. And if we click it even further into this, we can take a look at what that, that looks like in a Mirador context. And here you see a number of different um, annotations, each one with a bounding box. And if we uh, hover over one of those, uh, we can see that um, we're looking at a description in Italian and then a bunch of tags, including the person, Eva Ponzi, who created that annotation. Uh, so we can build in um, a sense of authorship into annotations as we're working with them in IIIF. And those annotations remain as we zoom in and out. Uh, and we can take a look here and see everything that they thought was important to call out in this particular annotation. And if we zoom back out, we can see that there are other annotations around the page, uh, including some examples of heraldry, uh, specific animals. Whoops, there we go. So we see a bird holding a banner, uh, which has a motto uh, listed here within the annotation. So you can pack a lot of information and a lot of diverse kinds of information into an annotation from keywords to uh, specific transcriptions or descriptions to the person who created the annotation. And that all then can be shown in Mirador um, or other viewers uh, as part of the user experience as you're walking through uh, an image object. So again, the link to this uh, set of projects is there. If you're looking for um, inspiration for what you could do with with what we think of as simple annotations, uh, then go ahead and take a look at that. Um, and then let's talk a little bit about how we create those. So within IIIF, uh, we have a number of tools starting to emerge uh, for annotation creation. Uh, and we'll talk about those throughout the week. Um, some of them are very specific like uh, for annotating points on maps. Uh, some of those are very generic, like the Mirador annotation tools, which allow you to just comment and can be very freeform, uh, to transcription-focused annotation tools and so on. Uh, and we'll have some guest visits from people who, who specialize in this. So we'll explore this in more detail. Um, but what I'd like to do is start with annotating an object in Mirador as a very simple use case, uh, because that's something that many of you have talked about already. So what I'm going to do is go back to this object in the Stanford Digital Repository, one leaf from Dante's uh, Inferno. And I'm going to, again, pull it over into Mirador and open it up. And in Mirador 2, uh, we have some annotation tools built in. I don't believe these are available yet in Mirador 3, but I'm not certain about that. I'd love to be corrected. Um, but I'm going to click on this speech bubble here and open up the annotation tools. And just a quick orientation to what we're looking at here. Uh, there are different shapes that you can use to create your annotation uh, from a square to a, an oval to a, a freeform squiggly line. Uh, to a random polygon uh, with a, finally a pen just to drop a, a pen point on. Uh, and then various uh, styling tools that you can use for thickness of a bounding box or color of the bounding box. And the simplest way of getting started is to, let's just grab a rectangle annotation 
draw it around this particular uh, initial and say initial T um, and perhaps we could say something like ELA. Uh, those are my initials, so I created that annotation and we'll save it. And so you can come back and take a look at that initial T there, the LA. That's not a terribly creative example, but um, gives you a sense of what you could do very quickly in Mirador uh, with the tools that are available. Um, and you can, of course, build up more complex details there. So I'm going to pause for a minute there. We've walked through looking at what annotations might look like created on an, a IIIF object, and then the simple act of creating a, a very bare bones annotation on a region of, of an image. Uh, do you have questions at this point? When do you save annotations in Mirador? Do you create files that you can keep to work with later? Excellent question, Valeria. Um, in most of the demo instances of Mirador that we host, uh, you're not saving annotations. They basically disappear when you close your browser. Glenn is going to walk us through um, storing annotations. Uh, and I believe he's using Mirador as his front end and then the simple annotation server as a back end, uh, where every time you create an annotation, uh, it will save to this data store and then can be used uh, later. And you can even pull out annotations and work with them in different tools as well. Uh, so Glenn's going to go into that in a little bit more detail uh, when he talks about the annotation server and working with annotations. Um, perfect, excellent. Other questions about where we are with annotations now? So can you share your annotations with others? Uh, yes. Um, you can share your annotations with others. You don't have to. Um, and the other part we'll talk about as we go on with the week is how to host your annotations so that I, A, other people could see them, or B, other people could work with them and edit them. And both are possible. Um, and you can also keep your annotations private uh, if you'd like to. Uh, John asks, can you create annotations as portable objects as well? So say opening a manuscript page with one set of annotations or another. Uh, yeah, that's a much more complicated use case. In theory, you can. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the complications that come in when you might be working with uh, a manifest from one institution uh, that multiple people have annotated over time. Uh, so a lot of it comes down to, to how you set up a manifest. Uh, and also how the software interacts with that. But in theory, yes, that's possible. Okay, so I think we've reached a, a pause point there in the questions. If you have more questions about the simple process of creating annotations, we can come back to it. Um, I'd like to talk about a slightly more complicated um, or slightly more in-depth annotation uh, approach, and we're going to hear more about this later this week as well from Cogat, which is um, using annotations to guide a viewer through an experience. Uh, and we're going to look at Cogat's stories viewer. Um, and we'll also perhaps this week talk about the, the suite of tools that Nikki O'Neill has developed um, at North Carolina State University that does similar, similar work of taking a set of annotations and then walking a user through a IIIF object uh, in a guided way. And the first thing I'm going to do is just show you an example of this so that you get a sense of what I'm talking about. Uh, so this is an image uh, that we host here at Stanford um, from the Burke Collection. And you can see when we open up this view of it, uh, we get a little bit of metadata at the front that has been put in, and then some navigation tools. So I'm going to go ahead and click into this. And uh, the first annotation that we've got is that this historiated initial S was cut from an antiphonal produced in the region around Milan in the early 16th century. So just an overall description of the image that we're looking at. But the next annotation takes us into a region of interest within that. Uh, and here, you can see that it's focusing on this B 
between one of the figure's feet. And that B happens to be a signature for the artist who decorated this manuscript. So we see this artist's B show up in uh, other objects as well. And if we click again, uh, you can see that uh, it's been stated that this particular artist was influenced by Leonardo da Vinci because of the background details that you see here, including the reflection of the city in the water. So it's taken us from one very close-up detail to another close-up detail that we might want to call out for a user. And if we click forward one more time, then we can see that the clouds in the sky here are actually cherubim and angels. Uh, so something that you might overlook on a first glance at an image, you can draw the user's attention to that uh, by zooming in on it. We'll keep going. Uh, we back back out and this annotation now calls attention to the uh, animal uh, figures that actually make up the S. So the bird-like face here, uh, fish-like faces here. Um, and then the brilliant gilding that surrounds this particular uh, illuminated uh, initial. And then that's the end of that very brief show. So we've taken about five annotations and created a user experience with that. Uh, in the, um, the Git book, we've got links to take you to uh, each step of this process to create one of these yourself. So before uh, the COG app uh, presentation later this week, you might get familiar with this so that you've got more in-depth questions to ask the folks who are, are presenting in more detail there. Um, but again, a quick pause. Uh, can we export a set of zoomed in annotated regions, for instance, all the angels bearing arms and see them all in a viewer? And yes, you can. Um, Mike Appleby, was one of the, the first people to do some real, really good experimenting with this um, when he was working with some use cases at Yale, gosh, six or seven years ago now, I think, Mike. Uh, and that's an excellent way of, um, of playing around with uh, IIIF annotations. Uh, the other um, one that I might call out is the background on my Zoom here, uh, which are uh, zoomed in annotated um, initials from about 100,000 pages of medieval manuscripts. Uh, and we used a machine learning project program to find them and annotate them. So you don't have to do all of your annotations by hand, uh, but then pulled them back out and just visualized them in a web page. So it looks almost jewel-like in the background now, but if you zoom in on each of those, it's an initial uh, served up by IIIF pulled out uh, from an, an existing manuscript. Raphael, does that answer your question? Okay, perfect. Great. Um, okay, other questions on the basic annotation that we've covered so far? Okay. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do then is talk about another very common research use case, which is transcribing textual material that's in a IIIF image. And what I'd like to do is talk about a project that some of us participated in uh, last month called um, La Sfera, uh, the La Sfera Challenge. Where did I get my link there? There we go. Uh, so this was a, a project that was put together by Laura Morreale, a scholar who works on 14th and 15th century Italian manuscripts and French manuscripts. And she wanted to set up a, basically a, a IIIF-based uh, annotation project, um, which took three different manuscripts of the same text and three different teams of transcribers. So we had five or six people on each team transcribing these, these materials uh, in a race. Uh, and so we had Team USA working on a, a manuscript uh, from the Beinecke Library. Uh, so, uh, uh, manuscript from the Arsenal Library in Paris on Equipe France, and then a Vatican manuscript on Squadra Italia, um, all three being served by IIIF, but being pulled together in um, a piece of software called From the Page. And we're gonna hear a little bit more about this particular piece of software later in the, the week as well uh, from Sarah Brumfield. Uh, and this is a wonderful IIIF um, 
compliant crowdsourcing tool, which can also be used for team-based challenges or individual work or classroom-based work um, for transcription. And so what we did with this particular project was we used IIIF to import manuscripts from three different institutions into the From the Page platform uh, so that each team could work with them. And what that means basically is when you drop into one of these pages of a manuscript, you have a IIIF compliant viewer on the left-hand side, and then just a place to add text in transcription along the right-hand side. Uh, just want to reemphasize at this point that we consider transcriptions to be a kind of annotation. So what this tool is doing behind the scenes is to take this IIIF image and link this text that's being created to that image. And it's doing it at the full page level. So there's nothing more granular happening here. It's just saying that on this particular IIIF image, this text appears. Uh, so it's, it's one way of approaching transcription. Uh, we've also seen people do it line by line. And as we saw demonstrated last week, uh, even allowing machine learning algorithms to do the transcription for us. Uh, but this is, this is a, a great way of human interaction uh, and collaborative transcription using IIIF underneath. Uh, and to kind of return to some of the questions, is it also TEI compatible? Yes, yes it is. Um, and I'm just going to take a quick gander up here at export for this. And you can see that you can export your transcriptions as an HTML page, as plain text, as very simply marked up TEI, which you could then elaborate on, or as IIIF annotation lists. So those four options give us a, a lot to work with, um, starting from a IIIF image, pulling all the way back out to XML, plain text, or IIIF uh, annotations. And what that means is that now that the uh, annotations are, or the transcriptions are done, uh, we can actually build different comparison projects with them. So we have here uh, Mirador 2 with the, um, the three manuscripts in them and hover over annotations. I'm going to turn those off for a second, but they're coming along. So that you could simply move through the pages of the manuscripts if you wanted to. You could scroll through the transcriptions by the page in Mirador 2, or you could open these up in Mirador 3. And I'm going to go ahead and turn on the annotations here and here which is a slightly different, <laughs> well, technical detail, of course, occurred because I was trying to do this live. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is that because Mirador 3 presents annotations in a different way, you now have uh, basically a side-by-side -side text and image comparison view that you have a little bit more control over outside of the From the Page platform. So we've so far covered simple comparison, uh, simple annotation, transcription, and portability of transcriptions into other pieces of software. Do we have any questions at this point? Okay, great. Well, that's, that's the 45 minute brief overview I wanted to give. There are a lot more tools that we'll talk about over the course of the week and we'll, we'll see some of those, uh, whether it's stories or from the page or some of the machine learning algorithms that are available via IIIF uh, over the course of the week. If you've seen anything today that you think that's what I would like to use for my project, uh, don't hesitate to get in touch with any of us and we'll walk you through how to use the software uh, with existing images. And of course, once you've got your image server set up, uh, you'll be able to use these um, in your, with your own content. Um, some of the questions that can continually come up when we give workshops like this are how do we save and host annotations and research outputs? Um, how do we credit contributors? You saw one example of crediting contributors in the Vatican uh, project. 
Uh, but this is an ongoing question that we want to keep coming back to is, you know, how do we make sure that um, specific contributors of content are being credited the way they should be? And this becomes a bit of a challenge with large crowdsourcing projects, uh, but also with individual contributors. Uh, how do we notify others when new annotations are published? And I'm hoping that Glenn will talk about this a little bit later in the week, but there are some recipes that people have been experimenting with um, that would notify in some way an institution or a project uh, if new annotations are being produced. Um, but I'd like to now open up the floor for the next 10 minutes or so uh, to you. Uh, you know, are there research problems that you're interested in that we haven't covered yet today? Uh, are there questions about how to get started with some of the software? Uh, or are there more general questions that we can help you with at this point? And I'm going to stop sharing my screen at this point as well. Maybe the first thing I'll ask is, um, if Mike Appleby and, and Glenn Robeson have additional comments to add here, uh, is there anything that I've forgotten in terms of basic working with IIIF materials for research that you think we should call out at this point? I don't, Ben, this was great. Great. Glenn, you've, you've, you've basically led the field in the annotation uh, management. So is there anything that you want to either preview for the week or problems that you've run into in this space, uh, working with researchers or with crowdsource projects? Because you also, when you were at the National Library of Wales, had a lot of experience with some, some very intricate crowdsourcing projects. I think you're being very kind, Ben. <laughs> um, I'm, you know, I've, I, I do like annotations a lot. And uh, when I worked at the National Library of Wales, um, we were very keen to kind of um, build crowdsourcing uh, solutions. Um, and so that's where we really started getting into annotations. Um, and on Thursday, I'm hoping to show you uh, one of the crowdsourcing solutions we had uh, with Mirador. Um, and as Ben mentioned, the simple annotation server, which is a annotation server I wrote to, um, to store annotations. Um, but there are also many out there which are probably better maintained nowadays. Um, and I'll go through some of the other options uh, on Thursday. Um, I think the questions that you put in um, uh, in the Git book are exactly the ones that seem to come up is, um, how do you store and save annotations and how do you share annotations with others? Uh, and I hope we can cover some of that over uh, on Thursday. Um, Credit contributors is really interesting. It's not one that I've come across, but I can see in the more research cases that that's incredibly important. Mm -hmm. um, and the notification one is um, is still something that's being actively investigated. And, and Ben, you mentioned um, there's been a couple of prototypes, I think, by Jeff Witt and others. Um, but it's still something that's being discussed in the discovery group as a kind of an open question about how we notify um, people that we've added annotations to different manifests or um, change man added tables of contents, and I think that's still still an open question. I fear Ben has frozen. You there, Ben? back then. Sorry about that, Glenn. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I missed your your last comment. Uh, just I think I was just saying agreeing with the questions that you raised. Um, okay. yeah. All right, so let, let's turn it over to the participants. Um, how many of you are thinking about annotation work or transcription work uh, for your projects? 
see one thumbs up, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, great. So annotation will be something that we keep coming back to. Thank you for all those. Uh, that's, that's very helpful. Was there anything that we covered today so far that left you with open questions? Like that's not going to just anything that wouldn't serve your purpose or did you see anything sort of that either sparked interest or that would like you to, you would like us to delve into further in particular topics in the days ahead? Uh, Valeria, Valeria. Yes, um, I was wondering if um, you showed us different kinds of annotation and also that path that you can make for a user experience. And I'm wondering is, are those, can they live on the same like digital object? So you can have like the ability to have annotation, but also the ability to have like path for users. And do you turn on and off, like depending on how you use the the software, the Mirador, or? That, that's an excellent question. Um, yes, <laughs> is sort of the answer. Um, the annotations are essentially data about the IIIF object. How you interact with those depends very much on the type of software that you're using. Uh, so the stories uh, software is very, very guided, but it can, it can be presented as narrative text alongside the snippets of image, or it can be uh, expressed as that step through process within the, uh, the viewer. Um, the tools that were developed at North Carolina State uh, also have that multimodal approach so that you can have a simple list of annotations that allow you to guide a user through or to experience in a different way altogether. But again, it's going to depend a lot on the software that you're using. The basic concept of the underlying annotation, though, is just that. It could be a static view. It could be something that drives software to a different kind of experience. A um, couple questions popped up in chat as well. And Judita, is there a way to create, record, export, and reuse more complex annotations, such as those identifying recurrent patterns, such as wavy lines identifying water, air, hair? If yes, could I then create a vocabulary of signs or patterns in the form of annotations? Excellent question. Um, I'm going to defer to Glenn and Mike a little bit on that uh, because I'm not sure that I've seen quite that level of detail done with annotation projects, but maybe Mike or Glenn have. I guess the question I would have is, are, are you thinking of manually annotating those and then building a library that you could search? Because I could, I could show an example where we did a sort of similar thing with manuscripts, um, the project Ben that alluded to uh, several years ago, where we, we had a team of uh, graduate students annotate manuscripts, use a controlled vocabulary to tag them, then we built a search engine across, across those so you could search for inhabited initials and this particular saint and you would get all the results back. So we built this sort of database of, uh, you know, of, of the iconography within the manuscripts. And so that might be um, what you're going for. If you're looking for an AI approach, um, no, I haven't seen that yet. <laughs> but but Jack, Jack Reed would be the person to ask on that one. For sure. Great question, Chitita. And maybe we can continue talking about that. Uh, over the course of the week to see if there's something that we can do to, to help you with that. Uh, Christy Karpinski asks, is there a viewer that can show transcriptions per page of a manuscript? Each page has its own transcription, but is shown as one object. Uh, and I think if I understand correctly, um, and please clarify, unmute yourself if you'd like to, um, basically, the the transcriptions like the ones I showed from from the page, each page has its own transcription, but you export it uh, so that all of those go with the, the full digital object. So as we were looking at those in Mirador, if I change the page in the manuscript that we were looking at, uh, the the um, transcription would also change. So they're they're linked up page by page uh, or page image by page image uh, throughout the entire book the annotations could live in multiple places, uh, but basically they're being brought together in that user experience page by page throughout the book. Uh, but please, 
correct me if I, I didn't get that question, um, if I didn't understand that question completely. That was what I meant. Yeah, thank okay. you very much. Great. Sure thing. Okay, other questions? And if you don't feel comfortable or if questions come up later, uh, please feel free to just ask them on the, the Slack channel uh, and any number of us will, will answer uh, asynchronously. Um, okay, here's one, uh, another from Judita. If an institution such as the BNF is a IIIF partner, does that mean that all its digital items are IIIF objects? How could I know that an object is IIIF if it does not show the IIIF logo? Again, thinking about the BNF. And when I do know that, how could I export it as a IIIF object? Okay, uh, so that's a, an excellent question. Um, and it also gives you a sense of sort of where we are within the, the IIIF universe at the moment. Uh, so all of the digital books and manuscripts in, the, in Gallica are IIIF objects at the moment. And there's almost no way to know that from Gallica. So you have to do that little formula of adding uh, and manipulating the URL. And I'll share that formula with you here. But another way of approaching it is to look at where uh, Bayonet manuscripts have been aggregated elsewhere. And I'll flag this up right now. Uh, the Biblissima project in Paris has a, a manuscript and early book aggregator that brings together content from the BNF and from other libraries in France and actually across Europe uh, into a, 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 an aggregate um, discovery environment where it's very clear where the IIIF manifests are. Uh, and we'll go ahead and put those links into the Gitbook as well. Um, other institutions, though, it's a little less clear. So uh, not to call out anybody for anything, institutions have implementation paths that vary depending wildly on cost, size, complication. Um, but the British Library is one to take a look at where many of their digital objects are not IIIF, but some are. And there's no very clear way of finding that within the institution. So some of this, I'm afraid to say, and I'm sure Glenn and Mike will back me up on this, uh, is a problem that we're trying to solve within the community um, because it is such an issue in terms of uh, how users navigate through. Other than that, it's kind of inside baseball. So if you're looking at an institution and you, you wonder if they're IIIF compliant, please don't hesitate to ask on the, on the channel. And maybe somebody will have a connection with that institution. Glenn certainly has a pretty good idea of who the participating partners are now. Uh, and we can always bring that conversation out to the wider community. And I should just make a, a plug at the moment for that, which is you all are in a classroom setting sort of now. Uh, and hopefully you're starting to get a sense that this is very much a community driven effort. If you have questions about IIIF and IIIF content, the IIIF community is very broad and it's spread across the world and it's very welcoming. And uh, there are a bunch of people who are willing to answer questions. Uh, Slack is a great way to do that. Um, but if you're not getting your question answered, don't hesitate to be persistent because people will hop in and help you out. And if you're not necessarily comfortable asking questions of the broader community, there are a couple of channels devoted to new IIIF members. Um, uh, I think it's called a beginner's channel, uh, but there, there are a couple others uh, where you should feel free to just go, go in and ask any question. There are basically, no, there really are no dumb questions in IIIF. Uh, we're all learning as we go. And I encourage you to take your, your questions to the broader community as well. Uh, if you don't get the answers that we need in, in this particular cohort. And that puts us right at time. Are there any additional questions before we, we finish off this particular lecture? If not, then I, I thank you for your time and I look forward to chatting more with you in the days ahead. It's really great to have you here and, and we hope that we can uh, really bring you into the IIIF fold, okay? Have a good day.